Evening Church, let's begin the service by singing 495 there in your songbook, please. Let's stand together since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, let's sing it together. Four, nine, five, one. standing. so good to see you in the Lord's house tonight. I hope you've had a good week. We've had a marvelous week here. Uh, later tonight at the close, we'll uh, explain some of the things that have happened. All, God's always good to us. While we were singing, I kept thinking of that song, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. And uh, He has changed my life. I was living over here in Centerville, and we were attending church in Irvington. It wasn't a city yet. It's now called Fremont. And in 1956, I was standing next to my dad in church. We were singing. You know, Brother Raisley, I, I recognize, I knew, oh, I'd lie. I'd lie to my mother and dad as a young boy. I'd get mad. I knew I was a sinner. I, I just knew that. I, and I loved my parents dearly to the day they both died. I just loved them, never wanted to hurt them. I get so mad inside over things. And the conviction of God came to my heart. I knew, I knew. No one had to tell me I was a sinner. And I remember that night walking into the aisle, and uh, my dad could have led me to Christ there, but we had lanterns going. We didn't have electricity in that building in Irvington. I walked forward. A Sunday school teacher, a deacon's wife, led me to Christ. My life was changed. Amen. I wish I could tell you I've never been disappointed in myself, been a perfect life. I've, I've never sinned. I wish I could say that. But I'm glad that the blood of Jesus Christ, Amen. his son, cleanses, cleanses us from all of our sin. It's perpetual. It's so good to be in God's house. Amen. And uh, Brother Pastor Everson, come lead us in prayer. Ask God's blessing, please. Well, let's pray together. Father, we sure love you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, your goodness. And Lord, tonight we're so thankful for the midweek service here at North Valley Baptist Church. We love your people. Thank you for their faithfulness. And Lord, we need to hear from you tonight. And we ask that you would anoint this service. And Lord, I pray that in a very unique way, uh, as your word is delivered to our hearts, uh, you would speak to us in that still, small voice. And Lord, may we be strengthened as a church family. I pray that we would be challenged and convicted tonight. And may we leave here looking more like the Lord Jesus himself. 
Lord, we realize we're living in a day where the world has no idea who Christ is. And I pray that our lives would manifest his presence. Thank you for your love and your goodness to us. We ask all these things in his name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. 256 together, please, in our songbook. 256. Are you washed in the blood? Ah, oh, ladies, if you can find your part in the chorus, let's sing it together on the first. Have you
bless you, ladies. That's wonderful. Oh, here's a grand song. 468, please. Shall I turn back into the world? Oh, no. Not I, not I. Let's sing together. On the chorus now.
you and thank you for the ladies group as well. It's time for the offering and all God's people said Amen. Amen. I'd like to receive an offering tonight for this service. Uh, this service is costing us not with utilities, just, just in fines from our government $5,000. We'll have more to say about that later tonight. That grieves me so much. I would never think this day would come in America, and yet it has. And uh, I'm going to beg you to keep standing. Amen. We don't serve toward victory, we serve in victory. And uh, I hope that tonight you can do something. These fees were $10,000 on Sunday and 5000 tonight, and they just continue every time that we gather together to sing. And every time we gather together to preach this book and to pray. Though I will talk to you later about so many wonderful things that are happening, I will say that our congressman and I have been talking quite a bit this week. Um, he will remind me quite often, and he may be listening in DC tonight that he's on this side and I'm on this side. Uh, the spectrum, what we both believe, but somehow, several years ago, as a young man, we became very close friends. He invites me to D.C. every year. We go to the president's prayer breakfast, and I sit at his table with many other senators. It's just an amazing thing. He loves this church, and he just could not believe that the county was putting fines on our church. He said, you can't do that. He said, Pastor, you know, and he was a Stanford professor, but he goes, you know, I'm a constitutionalist. You, you, you cannot do this to a church. It's against the law. It's against the Constitution. And uh, so we went through the whole thing, and I read him the, the requirements for one thing is, not only can we not come in the building, but we cannot sing. Who'd ever think that a government would tell you you cannot sing? But that's where we are. And... Uh, and he said, Pastor, I'll, and here's what he said to me. He said, tomorrow, uh, I'll call Gavin. And Gavin Newsom, he has a cell phone. And then he said, I'll call Sarah. He's talking about Dr. Sarah Cody. And uh, he called them both yesterday. They talked. And um, then they, he sent me the response. It wasn't positive. We talked to Sarah Cody's lawyers yesterday. And they said, you know what, and don't say amen. They said, here's what we'll do for you. We will, don't say amen, we'll drop all the fines. Just we'll drop everything as long as you comply. Which means you don't sing and you don't go to church. Oh, I tell you, that's very frightening. We have 14 grandkids. Now, somebody else may not want their grandkids to be brought up around God, but my wife and I do. Amen. We brought our children up around the Lord, and two of our sons are pastors, and you'll hear the other son tonight preach, son-in-law. All three of our kids are serving God. All 14 of our grandkids are wonderful children. We want them to be able to go to school. There's a Supreme Court hearing in California Friday about that. We'll tell you something about it. 
We want our kids to go to Christian school. We want them to have Sunday school that they haven't had for this Sunday, 25 weeks. Uh, we want them to be able to learn, Jesus loves me, this I know. We want them to learn to be kind to their neighbors, even when their neighbors may not be kind to them. We, we want them to know the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. So tonight, I just beg you, and I'm so ashamed to tell you, I need your help to pay these fines. Ushers, please come. And as we look forward to give, uh, at the close of the service, we'll hear from Brother Cooper some things that he knows. But Brother Cooper, why don't you come and lead us in a word of prayer for a good offering tonight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege to go to church tonight. It's a blessing to live in a country that we have liberties and freedoms to do these kind of things. And thank you for the word of God. Thank you for prayer. I pray that you bless the offering tonight. I pray you'd help us to give faithfully and liberally. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for the courage and conviction of these dear people. I pray you'd help us just to be faithful to you. Thank you for all you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't introduce the speakers when they speak, but tonight we have the joy to hear my son-in-law. I remember the day when his mother and dad got saved here 30-some years ago, and God saved Brother Sam and Julie so marvelously. They were like family, but now they are the last 15, 16 years family. We share four grandkids together. We... Um, one of the nice things that's happened out of COVID is that we were shut in a lot at night times, and uh, Brother Sam and Julie would come on over, or we'd go to their place, and we'd fellowship. They bring encouragement to us. Uh, Brother Sam and Julie, you raised a man of God. Amen. We're so proud of him. I'm so thankful that he would marry our daughter, and our daughter would marry him, and they'd give us four great, great wonderful grandkids. Brother Fenner has taught in the school for so many years, been in the school 15 years. He's a graduate of our school, graduate of our college, worked in the school the last eight years. We have um, seen growth under his leadership every year until this year. And COVID has collapsed uh, many of our lives of our kids. And I don't think anybody's mad at us. It's just, it's different right now. And I'm so thankful for him. I know this, you're going to hear a man of God, Amen. and I'm so excited, and uh, thank you, Brother Fanera. You come, would you like me to sing a solo before you oh, yeah, come? Be Let's have you come <laughs> preach instead. What a privilege it is to be able to stand up here this evening and to preach God's Word. I'm so thankful for each of us, uh, for each of you coming, making it a point to be in church tonight. I received so many text messages throughout the day. And is there an echo, or is that just me? Is there an echo? I'm looking at Josh Prano up there. I taught you better than that. 
I've had so many kind text messages today and so many people letting me know you're, you're praying for you. And uh, this morning we had our staff orientation for the school staff. And I was right in the middle. We were going over so many things. And I received a very kind text message from Brother Chris Kissel. And he reminded me this evening that the fine for our church is $5,000. So I better deliver a good message. And so he said, no pressure. And so I appreciate those kind words. I'm really excited about that. If you have your Bibles this evening, open them up to the book of Numbers. Numbers in chapter 11 is where our text will be this evening. And I don't know about you, but over the last many weeks, God has just been doing something in my heart. I've always loved coming to church. I've always enjoyed the fellowship. I've enjoyed the preaching. I've enjoyed the singing. But it seems like over the last five or six weeks, it's, just, it's been so much more real for me. I feel like every song that we sing, it just takes on a whole new meaning. As I think about those words we sang a Sunday or two ago, we sang, Holy, Holy, Holy. And I began to think about how holy our God is, and I began to get a little happy. I began to get a little excited. You know, I, I have a desire more today than ever before to be in God's house. And it's such a shame that the day in which we live, where we're told it's not right to come to church. Because can I say something? It feels right tonight. It feels real. It feels like this is where I should be. I don't want to be sitting at home on my couch watching a TV or preaching. I want to be here. I want to feel the presence of God. I want to see his hand moving. And I am so excited to be in God's house. And I want to thank you because you had to make a decision in your life. Am I going to stay at home tonight or am I going to be at God's house? And you have chosen to be in God's house tonight. And I am so thankful. And I know God is honored. Numbers chapter 11, verse number 4 this evening. Numbers chapter 11, the Bible says this, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the verse I'd like us to see, focus on this evening, is verse number four. Who shall give us flesh to eat? Let's bow our heads this evening and pray. God, we do love you. And God, there is no place I'd rather be tonight than here in your house worshiping you. God, I pray that as we look at your word tonight, that you would speak to us. God, I believe you gave me this thought many weeks ago, and Lord, it's been in my heart. And God, I pray that tonight you would empower me. God, I ask that you would hide me behind the cross, or that you would be lifted up and draw men unto you. God, I believe this is the message of the hour. Please use it to speak to hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Who shall give us flesh to eat? The children of Israel at this time find themselves in a wilderness place. They find themselves on the way to the promised land. God has already brought them out of Egypt. God has already been doing miracles for them. And they come to a wilderness place. And they begin to look around at their surroundings. They begin to examine the situation in which they find themselves. And they begin to be fearful. They begin to doubt and they begin to ask God, God, who shall give us flesh to eat? Who's going to take care of us, God? Who's going to meet our needs? Who's going to provide for us? Who's going to give us the things we need in our life? It was a very hopeless place for them. You see, in the Bible times, this wilderness was a wild and uncultivated region. In many ca cases, it was a desert-like setting. It was a barren and an inhospitable place. Food and water were scarce. The heat was intense. Survival was paramount. It would have been very easy to perish in the desert. It would not have taken long for them to die in that wilderness place. And in the midst of everything, they began to look around and they said, who's going to take care of us? Who's going to meet our needs? And you might think to yourself this evening, well, that's, that's a logical question, right? They were in a desert place. I mean, I've watched enough Bear Grylls, Man vs. Wild to know that when you're in the desert, food and water are essential, right? They're paramount. You need essential vitamins, okay? It's important things. But we have to remember where the children of Israel came from. We have to look back and see where God led them to that place where they asked this question. 
If we were to go back to the book of Exodus, we find the children of Israel in chapter 1 in a place of bondage. We know the story how Joseph was raised up into Egypt to save the land from a famine. As a result of it, the children of Israel were reunited with Joseph. There, there was favor in Egypt from Pharaoh, and they began to live there. In, in Exodus chapter 1, the Bible tells us that there was a new Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And he sees the children of Israel, and he begins to be fearful of this great multitude. What am I going to do with all this people? They are greater in number than we are. And he has a master plan. We will put them in slavery. We will put them in bondage. We'll put taskmasters over them. And we will force them to work for us. If you go back and you study history, you'll see it's that during this time, a lot of the great cities of Egypt are built. A lot of the tombs, a lot of the pyramids. And it's an amazing thing. The children of Israel found themselves in bondage. There was nothing they could do for themselves. There was no way to ever work their way out of bondage. There was no hope of ever getting free from it. The best they could do was be born and die in bondage and slavery. What a hopeless situation they found themselves in. They began to cry out because of the turmoil. They began to cry out, and I'm so, God, I'm so glad there was a God in heaven who inclined His ear, who heard their cry and said, you know what, don't worry. I will send a deliverer. I will deliver you out of Egypt and take you to the promised land. Amen. We know the story how God raises up a man by the name of Moses. And he sends Moses to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, we of course know the series of miracles, the plagues, and how God did a mighty work in Egypt. Brought Pharaoh and the people of Egypt to their knees, and God delivered them out of Egypt. Amen. As they entered the wilderness, they began to push forward, and they came to an obstacle called the Red Sea. And it's an amazing thing. If you go back and you read the story, God told them to camp there. God said, you're coming on an obstacle. Go ahead and just stop there. Wait there a while. As they are encamping, as they are waiting, they turn around, and what do they see behind them? They see Pharaoh's army. They see the chariots. They know what's happening. Pharaoh is coming back to basically kill them. They cry out to Moses, and they cry out to God, did you bring us out here because there were no graves in Egypt? Did you bring us out here so we could die here? And of course, we know God brought them to the Red Sea and said, go forward. As they come to the Red Sea, that Red Sea parts and they cross over on dry land. As Pharaoh's army chases after them, God brings down those walls of water and causes a great victory in Israel and Egypt that day. And they see Pharaoh's army no more. And God says, I will get the honor for this. In the wilderness, as they began to move to the promised land, God says, I'll take care of every need. I'll give you a cloud by day to cool you down. I'll give you fire by night to, to guide you, to lighten you. I'll give you water from the rock. I will give you manna. I will provide your every need. You don't have to worry about it. Just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. They saw the very presence of God come down on Mount Sinai. Isn't it an amazing thing as you read, as Moses gets ready to go up and receive those tablets, the thunder, the lightning, the smoke, the fire, and God's presence comes down and meets with a man by the name of Moses. Kind of reminds me of two Sundays ago what we experienced and the presence of God that filled this place. It's an amazing thing. They saw that happen. They saw God move. They heard His voice as He spoke to Moses. They saw the victory over Amalek where the people raised Moses' arms and as long as Moses' arms are raised, there's a victory. And then we come to Numbers 11. Where after all of those things happen, all of those miracles, all of that supernatural provision, they come to the wilderness place and they look around them and they say, what is going on? I, I didn't sign up for this. I wasn't expecting this. This isn't what I thought. Who, who's going to take care of us? Who, who's going to provide us meat? Who, who's going to meet our every need? As I think about that thought, I ask myself, how is that even possible? How could the children of Israel, after seeing God move in such a mighty way, exactly. after seeing the miracles, after opening up their tents every morning, and there it was, God's daily provision, all they had to do was grab it. How could they come to a point where they look to God and say, in doubt, who's going to take care of us now? Wow. Who's going to meet our needs? Who can provide for us? 
And yet as I think about the children of Israel and how they lost that faith, I wonder in our lives tonight that we found ourselves in that exact same place. Where we look around us, and yes, God's been good, but we look around and we see wilderness. It's barren, it's desolate, it's scary. It, who's going to take care of us? When COVID began to break out in early March, my wife and I found ourselves planning and preparing to take a group of our high school seniors to Washington, D.C. We had been studying the situation, we had been monitoring it to make sure that everything was going to be safe, and really when it came right down to the wire, we made the decision that we were in fact going to take the trip. I believe at that time there was only one confirmed case in the Washington, D.C. area. Everything was still open. We talked to our, our Congress people, and they said, it's fine, go ahead and come. And so we went. We landed on a Monday morning after flying red eye, and we, we hit the ground running. I mean, we literally landed, got in a rental car, and went to Mount Vernon, and we did not stop. We kept going and going and going. And it's an amazing thing. There was sort of a, a, an eerie feeling while we were there. We went and we toured the Capitol building. And then the Capitol building closed down. We went and toured the monuments, and then they began to shut the monuments down. We went into the White House on that Wednesday, and that Wednesday night, they shut the White House down. It was almost as if the Chariots of Fire soundtrack were playing in the background, and us and the seniors were walking in slow motion, and Washington, D.C. was blowing up behind us. It was almost that epic. Not quite. I wish it was. But that's what it felt like. That Friday, we boarded an airplane, and we came back to San Francisco. Brother Luke Flood picked us up at the airport. As we began to travel back home, I began to ask him, so what's going on at home? What, what has pastor, what has he said? What have the meetings been about? And he began to update me. In the midst of that, my phone literally blew up. Text messages, phone calls, emails. It was that, at that exact moment that the county had said, we're closing schools down. Parents were contacting me, what are we going to do? Are we going to follow suit? Are we going to stay open? I gave a quick call to pastor and said, this is the situation. He said, let's meet when you get back, but we probably need to close the schools down. Within a, really a matter of seconds, the students, the seniors, began to see their cell phones, and I could see them. And almost in unison, they began to look at each other and, and ask, are we canceling school? And I remember, I, I was waiting for them to ask me the question, and one of them finally said, Brother Fenera, are, are we going to cancel school? And I said, it looks like we are. And I remember they cheered. They were excited. They were clapping. They were praising God. It's an amazing thing. You know, 20 weeks later when we were still closed, they weren't still praising God and cheering. They were not as happy. But it's an amazing thing when that happened. I literally came home and we started meetings. We started planning, preparing. We went online. And what we thought was going to be for two weeks ended up being the rest of the school year. I know when I speak on behalf of every single teacher, it was, a, it was a rough time. It was very new to us. We had never done it before. We didn't know what to expect. Everyone was unsure, and we kept hoping that we're going to go back. We, we were looking forward to going back, and for some reason, it just never happened. We never were able to go back. During that time, like you, I probably experienced every kind of emotion there was. I had my emotional highs and my emotional lows, my spiritual highs and my spiritual lows. The more I began to read the news, I'm a very political person, I, I enjoy following politics, I enjoy reading the news. Brother Kirby and I, at least once a week, have some kind of political conversation. Uh, it, it's just, it's in my nature, I enjoy all of that, but it seemed like the more I read the news, the more I followed what was going on, the more discouraged I became. I thought when school comes to an end, that's, that's going to be it. That's going to be the break. Life's going to get better. Everything's going to be okay. School came to an end, and unfortunately, things did not get better. It was the same. And I remember experiencing some discouragement. My wife and I, every summer, try to take our family and take a trip or go on a vacation for a little bit just to kind of get away and refresh. And we began looking at what options there were, and there really weren't many options. Everything was closed. And so we had been talking about for some years, let's take a road trip. And we said, hey, this, is, this year's as good as any. And so we rented an RV, and we're like, let's hit the road. Let's get out of here. Let's just go. And I was excited. We're going to get on the road, and I'm just going to drive as far away from here as I can. We set a few ground rules. We decided, okay, if we go, we are not going to be checking our news. 
We're not going to be checking what's going on in the news. I'm not going to follow the politics. And no matter what, we will not talk about COVID or anything going. It sounded great. <laughs> but no matter where we went or who we talked to, that was the topic. Everyone wanted to talk about it. Everyone was asking what's going on. Oh, you're from California. How are they? And it became the nonstop theme. We traveled up to Wyoming and went to um, Yellowstone National Park. What a beautiful place that was. Made our way over to Mount Rushmore and enjoyed the time there. It was, we were there literally just days before President Trump arrived, and you could, you could feel the buzz and the excitement. People were coming, people were waving the Trump flags and had the hats, and it was a very exciting moment. We got ready to begin to head back home. And through all of it, I had just been feeling so low. I had been feeling discouraged. What's going to happen? Unsure. There was uncertainty. And on the last day, we decided we were going to rent some ATVs, and we were going to hit the trails there behind Mount Rushmore and the Black Hills, and we did. What a fun time it was. It was an amazing time, driving through the trails, going up rocks and boulders and all kinds of things. Just an amazing time. We had about an hour left in our rental, and we decided, let's take, you know, some of the kids wanted to go back, and so we split up. And we said, let's make our way back to the area where we rented our ATVs, and there were some sand dunes. Let's spend the last hour there, and then we'll return them. We would take turns going back and forth. One vehicle would be at the top of the hill. One would go down, come back up, and the next one would go. And we did that back and forth. I can remember as we were coming to the end, being at the top and watching my wife drive down, and something wasn't right. Instead of coming down off that sand dune, it just stuck. Nose planted right into the sand dune and did not move. I watched my wife, I watched my daughter lunge forward, and I knew, I knew at that moment something was not right. I, I could feel it in my heart that it just, something went wrong there. Within a split second, my wife yelled for me, and I drove down there, only to see that my daughter, Reagan, had a cut going across her jawline and across her neck. Very deep, very open. Blood coming out, and in that exact moment, I had every thought, every imagination in the world just flooded my mind. I thought worst case scenario, I thought this and that. Really, without thinking too much about what I needed to do, I jumped in and I, I took a, a towel and put it up against my daughter's neck. And we drove back and called the ambulance, took us to the hospital. It was a very scary event. I thank God that he, he watched over her and protected her. It could have been so much worse. And as I spent about five hours sitting there in the parking lot, I just had so many things flooding my mind. Every doubt, every fear. It was perhaps one of the lowest moments in my life as I waited there. I couldn't do anything but pray. My wife would text me, this is where we're at, this is what's going on, the doctor said this, we need to do this, and I waited there. A few hours later, she came out, and my, my daughter was a big smile on her face. It's an amazing thing. I didn't have a big smile. My wife didn't have a big smile. And we saw each other. But we both began to tear up and cry, trying to hold it back for our daughter. Made our way back to the RV, and that night took it easy and had a bite to eat and tried to go to sleep, and I just couldn't sleep. I kept thinking in my mind, replaying it, all the events of that day. I kept thinking back, what if I had done this? What if I had made this decision? Maybe I should have done this, and I just could not sleep, and I laid there thinking about that event all night long. The next morning, we got up and we started to travel a little bit. We traveled from Mount Rushmore area into Wyoming and stopped for the evening, got a bite to eat, and I broke my rule and went online and started reading the news. And it was all, I was reading the news that I saw that schools aren't going to open. This school said they're not going to open. This school district isn't opening the school. And I began in my mind to question and wonder what is going on? What am I going to do? Do I have a job to come back to? If I could be real honest with you, at times I thought maybe, maybe I need to move. Maybe I need to find somewhere else. Maybe there's not a place for me to come back and work. That night I, I just couldn't sleep. I was thinking about it again. We got up early that morning about four o'clock and prepared the RV and we, we got on the road. Everyone was sleeping in back. Pastor was sitting shotgun with me, and I just began to drive. And in that darkness, in that stillness of night, early morning, I had every thought going through my mind. 
God, what, what is my purpose? If, there is not, if there's not going to be a Christian school, what am I supposed to do? I don't want to be a burden on the church. I, I don't want to, to be a burden financially. Do I need to find another job? Do I need to move for the sake of my family? God, what am I supposed to do? It was perhaps the lowest moment of my life. As I began to just continue to drive, something began to change around me. I noticed in front of me, I noticed on the sides of me in my mirrors, the sun began to come up. And when that sun began to come up, and that light began to shine, I began to think about how good God is. And I began to weep before Him, and I began to break, and I said, God, I'm so sorry. God, I'm so sorry for doubting you. God, you've been so good in my life. God, you've met my every need. God, you've provided time and time and time again. God, you've done the miracles in my life that were impossible. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for doubting you. That lasted maybe for about 30 or 45 minutes when I had that thought, and I began to just cry. I wanted to sing, but everyone was sleeping behind me, and I knew that wouldn't have been good. And so I just sat there and I cried and I drived and I thank God and I praise God for being who he was. I praise God for his goodness in my life. As the sun fully came up and I began to look around, I noticed I was in the Wyoming wilderness. Out in the middle of nowhere, there was nothing around me. It was a barren place. And a thought came into my mind. It wasn't a thought of my own. I believe God put it in there. It's taken from Psalm 78, 19. In which the psalmist, looking back on numbers, said this, the children of Israel asked this question, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Can God provide for his people in this barren place? Can God do what we can't in this wilderness place? Before I could even finish the question, before it left my mind, the answer popped in, God can. Yes, God can. There's nothing he can't do. God can, God can, God can. And I began to rejoice in the fact that I serve a God who can. There's nothing he can't do. If he can bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, he can provide for me in 2020. And I rejoice, and can I say this, every single morning, that was July 1st. Every single morning I've woken up with that thought, God can. Can God bring us through COVID? God can. Can God provide for the North Valley Baptist Church today? Yes, he can. God can. There's nothing he can't do. Can I tell you something? That changed my outlook. That changed my perspective. I have moved forward every day with the hope, with the belief, with the faith that there is nothing that is impossible for God. He can. And this evening, I want to ask you, North Valley Baptist Church, we find ourselves in the wilderness tonight. We find ourselves in a very unique situation where it is very easy to look around and say, what is happening? It is easy to become disillusioned and say, what am I doing in this place? Can I ask you, North Valley Baptist Church, 2020, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Of course, we know the answer is God can. There is nothing he can't do. God can. This evening, for the next few moments, I want to preach a message on God can. You see, as I began to think about how good God was in my life, I began to literally break before him. Can God lead the children of Israel out of bondage, out of slavery, when there was nothing they could do for themselves to ever better themselves, to ever make it to that promised land? Can God deliver the children of Israel? Yes, God can. Can I tell you, as Pastor mentioned this morning, mentioned just a few minutes ago, in the late 1980s, there was a family, the Fenera family, and they were bound, and they were on their way to a place called hell. There was nothing we could do to ever earn our own salvation. There was nothing we could ever do to earn merit with God, to work our way there. But my mom was invited to this church, the North Valley Baptist Church. I'm so glad that on that day, church wasn't closed. It wasn't locked up. It wasn't being fined. It was open so someone could find Jesus Christ in church. And my mom went on that big day service. At 941 Clyde Avenue, she sat and she listened to the preacher. The invitation was given as she came forward. There at the altar, met, she was met by Grandma Treber. 
And Grandma Treber opened up to God's word and said, Julie, let me show you. Let me show you how you can know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Let me show you what God's Word said. My mom on that day bowed her head and trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. She began to pray for my dad. She began to beg God, God, please save Sam. I can remember going to a family get-together at my grandma's house. And I don't know why, but for some reason we all ended up, or part of us ended up in my parents' minivan at Safeway think we were picking up ice cream, and I can remember playing in the back with my brother and my cousin. I knew something wasn't right. I don't know exactly what it was, but I can sense something is going on up front. My dad and my uncle are talking, and something's not right. I remember watching as my dad bowed his head, and my uncle bowed his head, and there in the Safeway parking lot off McKee Road, my dad trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior, forever changing my family's eternity and my destiny. On May 21st, 1991, a Tuesday evening, my dad came home from work and said, Son, I need to see you in the bedroom. That's typically not a good sign. I began to think, what did I do and which of my three brothers can I blame this on? And there at my bedside, my dad opened up God's word. And he said, son, let me show you what God's word says. I realized that I was a sinner. I realized I was on my way to a place called hell. I realized that my only hope to ever get to heaven was Jesus Christ. And there as an eight-year-old boy, I bowed my head and I trusted Jesus Christ as my savior. Can I say, people of the North Valley Baptist Church, have we forgotten how good God is in our lives? Have we forgotten what he's done for us? The children of Israel came to a place, as Moses went up to get those tablets, that they began to forget who their God was. Aaron caused them to create a golden calf, and he presented it to them and said, Behold, this is your God, Israel. This is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. You would have had to ask the question, how is that even possible? That the children of Israel could have been led out of Egypt by God, and they forgot who God was. This evening, as I ask you the question, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Say, how do I move forward uh, in this wilderness? How do I have a God-can attitude? How do I walk by faith? I want to give you four points this evening, and we'll be done. Can I say number one, remember who God is and what he's done for you. He brought us out of bondage. He brought us out of slavery. He reached down with a mighty hand and plucked us up from the miry clay, set us on the solid rock. He brought us from death unto life, from darkness unto light. He saved our souls and gave us a home in heaven. When's the last time we praised him? It's easy to focus what's going on around us. It's easy to complain, but when's the last time we fell on our knees and said, God, thank you. God, I praise you for being who you are. God, thank you for being everything I need in my life. You see, he's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the Almighty King, the Everlasting Lord. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the Almighty Creator. He is my Deliverer, and he can deliver me in 2020. You know, when God came down and met with Moses, he consumed this bush and began to burn, and Moses said, I better go check that out. God tells Moses, I have a purpose for you. I'm going to use you to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses begins to become fearful. And he said, God, I, I, I stutter. I, I, I can't speak properly. He begins to give God every excuse. And then he says, God, I, I don't even know your name. What is your name? I mean, they're going to ask me. And the, the children of Israel are going to ask me, who are you? I don't even know what to say. And I love what God tells him. He says, I am that I am. Tell them that I am. I heard one preacher say it like this. Moses said, I'm not a great speaker. God said, don't worry, Moses, I am. Moses said, oh, but God, I'm not an adequate leader. And God said, don't worry, Moses, I am. Moses said, oh, but God, I'm not able to do this task. But God said, don't worry, Moses, I am able. Moses said, I'm not enough, God, they need more. God said, oh, I'm enough. I heard another preacher say it like this. God asked Moses... God, what what am I supposed to tell these people? What is your name? And God said, I am that I am. Meaning what? You can't define me by words. There's, There's not a label you can put on me. I am too big for whatever description you can come up with. I am the God of gods. You can't name me. I'm too big 
I'm too powerful. I'm too strong. I'm too mighty. I am that I am. That's the God I serve tonight. You know, it's easy to praise God when life is going good. You know, last school year, I was on a drive to a league meeting for sports. And as I normally do, it's up in San Mateo's, about a 45-minute drive in traffic, and I, I began to listen to a playlist of songs I had and listened to the first song, and the second song that came up was God, God's Been Good. And I listened to that song, and it, it began to work on me a little bit. I thought, you know, I'm going to listen to that song again. And I replayed that song again. And I replayed that song again. And for my entire 45-minute drive, I listened to that song over and over and over and over again. Why? You can't exhaust how good God is. You can't ever get to a point where you don't think, hey, God wasn't good to me today. Why? God is always good. And I listened to that song on the way there. I listened to it over and over and over on the way back. Why? Can I say North Valley Baptist Church, God is good. The students probably got sick of that song because every opportunity they had to sing, I said, let's sing this song. The pastor said, I want the school to come up and present what's going on at North Valley Baptist Church. I thought, let's sing God's Been Good. And we did. We were, we were invited to the Best of the West tournament up in Regency, and we were asked to put together a group to sing a song. And I told Brother Jackson, hey, let's sing God's Been Good. <laughs> we had several different events. We were in Washington, D.C., I think on a Thursday night, we were at the Lincoln Memorial. We knew we were going to be heading home. And the seniors got together, and they began to sing, God's been good. Can I say, we came home, and they went into lockdown, into COVID. They never came back to school. But when we finally had graduation in June, you know what song we sang? That's right. God's been good. Why? Because in our good times, God is good. In our bad times, God is good. There's never a time where God is not good. He's always good. When's the last time, North Valley Baptist Church, we just praise God for who he is and what he's done in our life? Can I say number two, how do we get through this wilderness? We go forward in his presence. We go forward in his presence. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses and God are having a conversation. And Moses says to God, God, if your presence is not with me, don't, don't take us further. God, if your presence go not with me, I don't want to go. What is he saying? God, I have to have you in my life. God, I can't do this on my own. God, I need you to walk with me step by step by step. God, I need your guidance. God, I need your direction. God, I need you to lead me to do what I can't do. I need your presence in my life. One of the things COVID has done to this area it has slowed us down. We get so busy in our lives with our jobs and all the activities. I don't know why God allowed this to happen. I, I, I don't want to begin to tell you this is what I think or this is why, because I don't know. But I wonder if one of the reasons this has happened is to take the people of God and simply slow us down. I wonder how many times did we leave the house in the morning with ever getting in God's presence. How many times did we run out the door without ever calling on the name of the God and say, God, help me today. God, I can't do this on my own. God, I need you. God, I have to have your power. I wonder how many times we ran out the door, we went to work, we went through our daily activities in our own strength, in our own power, in our own might. Moses said, God, if your presence going out with me, I don't want to go. I wonder over the last 24 weeks, North Valley Baptist Church, have we come to the reality yet that we can't do anything about what we, what's going on around us? We have no control. It is literally out of our hands. As I began to work and prepare to open schools, we, we had a plan. Got a lot of plans. We're ready to go. If we were to get the word tomorrow that we could open school, we're ready to go. But you know where we find ourselves tonight? I find us in a place where there's nothing we can do. There's no email that I can send to fix it. There's no speech that I can give. There's no one I can talk to. It is completely out of my hands. So what, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to step back and say, all right, God, it's all on you. You know, so often we think that we got everything under control. 
We think that we can do it. We think in our own power and our own might. But that's not what Moses said. Moses said, God, if you don't go with me, I can't do this. God, the task that you called me to do is greater than my ability. I have to have you. Isn't it an amazing thing when we begin to fall on our knees and realize how small we are? And we look up, we truly see how big God is. And when you realize how small you are, and when we realize how big God is, how can you not go forward saying, God, I have to have your presence with me. God, I have to have you in my life. God, I can't do this on my own. Please, God, help me. We look to every other source for hope, except for God at times. I want to say, number two, go forward in his presence. I want to say, number three, focus on your deliverer instead of your desert. Focus on your deliverer instead of your desert. You know, as human beings, we look at our surroundings. We look at where we're at, and sometimes we ask ourselves, how are we going to get out of here? The children of Israel came out of Egypt by the strong and mighty hand of God. And yet they come to a desert and they ask themselves, who's going to take care of us now? How is that possible? They were focusing on their desert instead of their deliverer. I'm all for reading the news. I don't have a problem with that. I'm all for politics. I enjoy following it. But can I tell you something? Since July 1st, maybe a handful of times I've read the news. And maybe only a handful of times I have tried to see what's going on and what are the headlines. Why? It's too discouraging for me. You're not going to find hope there. There's not gonna, no one's going to be posting on there, hey, you know what, God can get us through this. It's not going to happen. But in His presence is fullness of joy. When I get into the presence of God and I walk with Him, and I wake up every morning saying, God, give me something today. I'm not going to find hope in the news. My answer isn't in the news. Oh, but I can find it in God's Word. I can get something daily from God's Word. He can speak to me and I can speak to Him. And I can trust that God can in my life. Focus on your deliver instead of your desert. They say, well, should I contact my elected officials? Absolutely. Let me tell you who I contact. I, I, every morning... I send notification to someone who's able to change the situation. Oh, you say, oh, you, are you talking about the, the mayor? Oh, no, no. If I email the mayor, I'm going to get her assistant. I go above the mayor. Oh, you're talking about Dr. Cody, our, our, uh, the county officer. No, if I email Dr. Cody, I'm going to get her assistant. I go above her. Oh, you're talking about our congressman. No, if I email the congressman, I'm going to get one of his assistants. I go above him. You say, you, you go to the governor? Oh, no, I don't mess with the governor. I go above the governor. Are you saying, you call the president of the United States? Oh, no. I go above the president of the United States. Every morning, I call on God Almighty, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one to every king and every ruler will bow the knee and say, worthy, you are God. That's the one I go to. Why? That's where my hope is. God can this evening. I'm not saying don't contact your elected officials. I believe there, there, there's, a, there's a cause and there's a reason, but let's not miss it. Let's not spend all that time, all that energy, all that effort, all that emotion contacting them when we serve the God of gods who's able to act in our behalf, who's able to change the situation. Why? Because God can. I want to say lastly, how do we get through this wilderness? We have to walk by faith and not by sight. As the children of Israel began to leave Egypt, God had them camp by the Red Sea. The Red Sea was an obstacle ahead of them. They could not go forward. Behind them, Pharaoh's army pursued and pushed on them. They were now in a very interesting position. They couldn't go forward. And enemies behind them, they couldn't go to the side. They had nowhere to go. In the midst of that, the people began to complain, saying, Moses, what did you do? Moses, did you bring us out here to simply die in the wilderness? What, was there no graves in Egypt, so you brought us out here? And Moses answers the people and says this. He says, stand still. Stand still and watch God do something amazing. And I had never seen this part before. I, I had never read this before. I missed it. But God responds to Moses... And he says, Moses, wherefore criest thou to me? M Moses, why are you crying to me? See, if you would go back before, God already tells Moses he's going to deliver him. 
He already tells Moses, hey, Pharaoh's coming after you, but don't worry, I'm going to take care of it. And they come to the Red Sea where they cannot go further. They have the Pharaoh's army behind them, and God looks down at Moses and says, cause the people to go forward. Pharaoh's army's behind me. The Red Sea's ahead of me. Go forward. What was God telling Moses? Hey, Moses, you can't see it right now. But I'm calling you out to walk by faith. Don't, don't step on what you can see. Don't act on what you see around you. Step out by faith. What is he saying? Hey, Moses, I'm going to need you to trust me. Moses, I'm going to need you to to have full confidence in me. Why? Because I'm going to deliver you. And in that obstacle, he didn't go around it. He took a step forward, walking by faith. And what happened? By faith, God parted that Red Sea. And they went through it. And they came out on the other side. And God then destroyed the enemies of his people in the midst of it. Here we are, North Valley Baptist Church. We got an obstacle ahead of us. We got people behind us who want to close our church. Where do we go? Do do, do we just stand still? Oh, I think God's answered that, and I think our pastors already showed us that. It's time to step by faith. It's time to go forward. It's time, even though we cannot see it, even though I may not understand how how am I going to get through this, God already has a plan. God says, I need you to trust me. I need you to have faith in me. I need your confidence. Why? Because I can part that sea. I can bring you through to the other side and give you victory. And what does God do? He does exactly that. You know, as Christians, we talk about faith. I mean, faith is basically, it's, it's, it's the main thing of what we believe. I wonder how many times we talk about faith, but when it really comes down to living by faith, by walking by faith, by stepping out what we can't see, what we don't know lies ahead of us, I wonder how many times maybe we turn back around and say, ooh, I don't know. I don't think so. God, I, I can't see what the next step is ahead. We find ourselves in a situation tonight where we have no option. We have the Red Sea ahead of us. We got Pharaoh's army coming behind us. It's time to step out by faith. As I read God's word, there's not a single person in this Bible who ever accomplished anything for God who did not do it through faith. What is faith? It's realizing how small I am, how big God is, and then totally relying on Him to do what we can't do. It's easy to have faith for God to provide a meal when my fridge is full. Oh God, I believe you're going to provide dinner tonight. Look, there it is. That's amazing. It's a little bit harder to step out by faith when we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know the outcome. We, we don't know what's on the other side, but can I re- remind us, North Valley Baptist Church, God has already given us the victory. God has already promised the victory. We can claim it, and we can go forward saying God can. There is no victory in the Christian life outside of faith. It's just not going to happen. But that's why we need to remember who God is. We need to read his word and see time and time and time again how he delivers his people. So why is it so important that we walk by faith in this wilderness? Why is it so important that we have a God-can attitude? Why does it matter so much if I have confidence in God? Can I say that? One, because God can. All throughout the scripture, we see God rewards faith. I think perhaps one of the saddest verses in the Bible is when Jesus goes back to his hometown You have to remember, Jesus had been doing miracles. He'd been healing person after person. The fame of him spread out, and he comes back to his homeland. The Bible tells us, there he did not many mighty works because of their unbelief. Because they didn't believe in God, because they didn't believe that Jesus could, what happened? There wasn't many mighty works there. How did Joshua see the walls come down? By faith. 
How did David see Goliath fall? By faith. Story after story after story, God can. It's faith. Why do we need to have faith? Because there is no other hope. I thank God for all the politicians who want to come and help the church. Humanly speaking, that's fantastic. I'm thankful for them. I appreciate their support. I really do. It means a lot. But let's not lose focus that our hope is in God. Our faith is in God. If we're going to see mighty deliverance, yes, I believe God can enable people to help us. God can use people to help us. But our ultimate deliverance is going to come from God Almighty. Can I say lastly, why do we need to have a God can attitude? Because there's another generation coming after us. 1997, I was a seventh grade young man. I can remember a pastor talking about the start of the college. I can remember this building, these buildings being the SAE, rundown buildings. And I can remember walking around, just like they did in Jericho, begging God to be able to buy this property. I can remember all of the things pastor would bring to us and say, we got to pray for this. we, we got to ask God. We have to beseech God that he would do something here. It's an amazing thing that as a young man, I've never forgotten all the miracles that have happened at the North Valley Baptist Church. I've never lost sight of what God has done in this place. The big days, the salvations, the baptism, the bus riders, I've never lost sight of all of that. I have a goal sheet here from 1997. As I look at it, I see so many of these items that pastor was proposing to the church we want to remodel the cafeteria for 40000 We want to repaint the auditorium ceiling and walls. We want to uh, build a bus barn. All of these different things, it's amazing. Here in 2020, I could check most of these off the list. Done. 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 Happened. Accomplished. Built. Built. A lot of builts. How is that possible? Because God can it just so happened in 1997, the theme for that year was God can. You know, as a seventh grade boy, I watched my pastor step out by faith. And I watched him say, hey, North Valley Baptist Church, we have some things we need to accomplish for the cause of Christ. Humanly speaking, it may not be possible. But can I say, church, God can? I believe God can. And you know what? Not only God can, God did. And here we are in 2020, and we're in a situation, can I say, I have children now looking at our church. I don't want to just tell them about the stories from the 90s. I, I don't want to tell them, you know, God used to do miracles back in the 90s. I want them to see it today with their own eyes. Why? There's another generation. I want them to pass it to their children. Joshua raised up stones, and they said, what meaneth these stones? And so they could look back and say, God did this. God can if I could put the theme up on the school, our school theme for this year is God can. You say, well, are you going back to school? At this point, humanly speaking, we're not. But I believe God can. We have one week until school starts. Parents, I wish I could give you, hey, for sure, this is what we're doing. But you know what? I can tell you that God can. I, I can't explain what's going on right now in our ministry. I know that a few weeks ago I had, a par I had a meeting, Zoom meeting with parents, and I told them the situation where we found ourselves with the school. And I said, can you please pray? I've gone by the school and I've seen families out there kneeling before God, saying, God, will you please, God, can you please bring uh, about a change that would allow our children to go back to school? I know that since this whole thing in our church has happened, I've seen so many unbelievable things. It seems like every time I drive by the church or walk by the church, there's someone out there praying. That wasn't happening a year ago. That wasn't happening five weeks ago. We are in a position where we have no other option. We are on our knees saying, God, please help us. God, I believe that you can. God, help us. We had staff orientation Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Not a single day went by where there wasn't rejoicing. There wasn't praising God. There wasn't tears and eyes. There wasn't people kneeling before God, broken, asking God to do something. North Valley Baptist Church, we have this opportunity. The eyes of the world literally are on us right now.
To think that we can have a video go out and have over two, almost two and a half million views. News reporters wanting to come to our steps. People texting from all over the world, hey church, we're praying for you. I don't know God, why God would put us in this situation. But perhaps it's so we can look up and say God can. Can God deliver the North Valley Baptist Church? God can. Can God open the North Valley Baptist schools? God can. Can God do amazing, mighty work in our midst? God can. Can God allow us to get those buses out to bring young people and teenagers to hear the saving grace of Jesus Christ? God can. Can God bring about revival to the United States of America? God can. And I don't know, maybe perhaps for such a time as this, God has allowed our church to be the focal point. And maybe, just maybe, through our faith, through our belief saying, you know what, we believe God can. And those of you watching tonight, pray with us. Why? Because God can. Whatever the issue may be in your life, whatever the problem may be, whatever the trial, the tribulation, or the desert place you find yourself in, never forget that God can. We serve a God who can. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Perhaps this evening you want to come forward and just praise God. Maybe it's been some time where you, you need to just tell God, God, you've been so good in my life. I'm going to ask Brother Caleb to play that song, I Have Been Blessed. When we think about how good God's been in our life, how can we not praise Him? How can we not thank Him for who He is and what He's done? Can we take our focus off what's going around us tonight and look to our Deliverer? Can we walk by faith and not by sight? Why? There's another generation that's watching. Tonight I challenge you, North Valley Baptist Church, God can. There's always much to pray for, but how magnified and obvious that is right now that we need to go to the Lord in prayer. Did you do that? I want you to pray for those, those in positions of secular power. You better pray for them. Pray that God would speak to them. God would deal with their heart. But we go beyond that and above that, like the preacher said. I'm glad we know who's on the throne. God will turn it for good. I've been telling this, to, telling this to preachers as they would text in across the country. God always wins the victory His way. He's never lost and He's not going to start today. He'll win the victory His way. It's an amazing thing. God moves mightily when His people stand. You read your Bible and you watch what the Lord does. I don't know, somebody would have to be, you'd have to be crazy to want to be on the wrong side of that position. All throughout the Bible, we're on the winning side. You pray. Pray for your church. Pray for the Christian school. He said God can. God could. We know it's the will of God that we have church. I believe it's the will of God that our young people are raised up and educated in a Christian environment. We know it's God's will that we sing because the Bible says singing to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's a Bible command. Long before there was a constitution, there was a Bible. We know that's the will of God. So let's pray. Lord, I pray that you bless this invitation tonight. Thank you for these faithful people, Lord, that have come this evening, our church family. I pray that you'd minister their hearts, help us to have faith in the fact that you can. There may be some who've joined us tonight and they've come for other reasons. I just pray that you spoke to their heart tonight. We know that you can. Thank you for being so good to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I certainly hope you friends online around the world, all the many countries have been watching. I hope you stayed with us. What a powerful message. And thank you, Brother Fenera. I guess you could probably see the man's heart tonight. It's been a good night in the Lord's house. God's always good. He's always good. Thank you, friends around the globe for watching tonight. We're going to speak to our people for a few moments.